Good morning, and could I extend a very warm welcome indeed to everyone um, to the service here in the East, and particularly if you're visiting us, we, we do extend a special welcome. We'd love to invite you for tea or coffee, but Church of Scotland guidelines don't recommend this at the moment, but welcome. Just a couple of items, say, from the, the bulletin that you picked up at the door. Just the Easterly magazine is ready for the district visitors to, to uplift. Um, the prayer meetings will continue this week. Uh, so that's the 1 p.m. meeting here in the church hall and the 7.30 by video conference. Uh, so they'll both take place. Ne next Sunday service will be conducted by the Reverend Alec James A. McPherson. And just lastly, a confirmation note that the funeral service for the late Mr. Derek Gardner will take place here in the church on Wednesday, 5th January at 11.45. So that's a week Wednesday at 11.45 a.m. These are all the intimations this morning. Good morning, little flock. It's good to see you all, and I trust the Lord will bless us as we worship him together. Our call to worship is in Psalm 18. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I am saved from my enemies. We sing to God's praise in Psalm 95. Psalm 95, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Come, let us everyone a joyful noise make to the rock of our salvation. Before, let us before his presence come with praise and thankful voice. Let us sing psalms to him with grace and make a joyful noise. When I was ministering Argyle, I used to take a, an evening service in a retirement home in Ardrishig, and uh, the numbers were very few on one occasion, and I said to the folks, there's not many of us tonight, we're going to have to sing up. And one old lady said to me, I can't sing, but I can make a joyful noise. And uh, that's what the psalmist is urging us to do here, a joyful noise make to the rock of our salvation.
Shall we come before the Lord in prayer? Have a blessed and eternal God. It is a wonderful privilege to fall on our knees and to worship you, the one true and living God, the God who has revealed himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the creator of the cosmos, the creator of the things we can see and the things that we cannot, that which is visible and that which is not. And we bless you, O Lord, that you did not simply make this beautiful world and then withdraw yourself and leave it, O Lord, to its own devices. But Lord, you are engaged at all times, sustaining this world and sustaining your people by your mighty word. We thank you for the great privilege that is ours as tiny creatures made from the dust uh, that we can engage with the creator of all things. And Lord, we marvel at you, the creator should stoop to speak to us, to, to engage with us when we consider who we are and, and what we are and what we have done and, and the things that go through our minds, O oh Lord. Why should you set your love upon us? Why should you not reject us? But Lord, your word tells us of your amazing love, a love which we do not deserve and which we cannot earn. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And we thank you for that cast iron promise that is given to us. And Lord, if we have not yet come to trust in Jesus, enable us, O Lord, to reach out with that simple and childlike faith and to believe in Jesus, knowing that when we do, you will keep your word and we will indeed not perish, but enter into eternal life with the wonderful prospect that when life's journey comes to its inevitable end, that we will pass over to be in the nearer presence of our Lord and Savior, seeing him even as he is in all his risen glory. Lord, your word tells us that the day will come when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And if we will not bow the knee in this life, then we will certainly be obliged to bow the knee in the life to come. We thank you, O Lord, for each family represented here today. We thank you that we've come here, hopefully with a, a sense of expectation as we wait upon you and as we sing your praises and as we read and meditate upon your word. May we afterwards be able to say that it was good to have been in the house of the Lord and in the company of the Lord's people. Lord, we pray that you would bless every such gathering of your people around the world. And as your word is read and preached, may it not return to your void, but may it accomplish the purpose for which you have sent it, whatever that purpose might be, whether it is to convict, whether it is to encourage, whether it is to build up or to tear down. Help us, O oh Lord, ever to uh, yield to the will of your Holy Spirit as he works in our lives and he seeks to conform us to the likeness of your Son, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, be with the people at this time of year for whom it's a very difficult and a very poignant time of year, especially as they think of loved ones no longer with them, loved ones who have been taken away. And we just pray for those who have lost loved ones from our own congregation in recent times. And may they know your presence with them um, being a, a comfort to them because Jesus himself uh, knows what it is to lose loved ones and he can identify with us, he can empathize and sympathize with those who mourn. So, Lord, bless us and bless every family represented here today. Remember the interim moderator with his extra duties. Remember the elders and the deacons. Remember every single individual who plays a role in our service of worship, operating the electronics to project the words that we sing onto the screens for uh, the organist and, and for everyone that uh, has a, an active role, for those who meet people and greet them at the door, for those who clean 
the church. And sadly, at this particular time, we're unable to have tea and coffee and meet afterwards. And we just pray, Lord, that this um, COVID that has descended on us once again, that uh, in your will, O oh Lord, that it would quickly pass. And we pray for uh, those uh, who have got COVID, and we do pray for them, Lord, that they would know your healing presence to be upon them. So bless us now. Be pleased to look upon us, and uh, may our praises, O oh Lord, come from the heart with a sense of thankfulness and gratitude for all your goodness to us. Bless us and take away our every sin, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now, boys and girls, I think there's one or two boys and girls around, the day after Christmas has a special name. Can anyone tell me what it is? Boxing day. It's Boxing Day. Yes, absolutely right. Today is Boxing Day. So what do we mean by Boxing Day? Does it, is, is it this kind of boxing? No, it's not that kind of boxing. I'm very glad to say that it's not. I wouldn't like to be engaged in boxing, although my brother, he was a very good boxer many years ago. So this is Boxing Day, but it's a different type of box that we're thinking of. It's this type of box here. So why, I wonder, are we thinking of boxes on Boxing Day? Well, the reason goes back many, many years, because a long time ago, there were a lot more poor people in Scotland, in Britain, than there are today. And they couldn't afford to buy a turkey or a chicken or even anything to have for a Christmas dinner. They would just be eating porridge or, or stale bread because they had no money to buy a lovely Christmas dinner. They couldn't even buy a Christmas pudding. And so there were many people in the country who did have money, who were able to have a lovely Christmas dinner. And so what they did was that they would take a box and they would put in the box perhaps uh, some duck, some turkey, some chicken, uh, some vegetables, some Christmas pudding, maybe some apples and oranges. And uh, on Boxing Day, they would give those boxes to poor people so that they too could enjoy a Christmas dinner. And so that's why it's called Boxing Day. And I wonder how many people in Inverness today would know the reason it's called Boxing Day. But we mustn't think of the poor people only on one day of the year, Boxing Day, because Jesus tells us that we will always have the poor with us. And so we have to think of them all of the time. And as a church, support those organizations that reach out to poor people and to homeless people. And so let us thank God in our prayers for the fact that we're in very well-off families, that we're able to enjoy a lovely Christmas dinner and help us to, be think, to, to, to think uh, of those who are not as well-off as we are. So thank you for listening. We're now going to sing a, uh, from Mission Praise. It's a hymn that I remember singing here many, many times when Mr. McDonald was the minister. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Keep me burning till the break of day.
you for the many good gifts that you lavish upon us, not just on Boxing Day, but on every single day. Help us, O Lord, to be thankful for your goodness to us. And we just pray, Lord, that you would take this money as a token of our gratitude and that you would use it through the Church of Scotland to reach out to the poor and for the building up of the church and for the spread of the gospel. Uh, make each one of us, O Lord, to be fishers of men, reaching out uh, to those who are still as yet strangers to the Lord Jesus Christ. So take this money and use it in your service, O Lord, and bless it. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our reading this morning uh, is in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, and uh, Alex Stephen will read from verses 26 to 56. Let us hear the word of the Lord. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at this words and wondered what kind of greeting This might be, but the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favour with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will he bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of this servant. From now on, all the generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever. Even as he said to her fathers, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Amen, and may God bless the reading of his most holy word. Let us pray now, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning for an opportunity to bow down our heads before you in prayer and petition, and for the joy of reading your word. We thank you, Lord, for that wonderful moment in time when you came from the realms of glory as a baby born in a stable to be the saviour of the whole world. 
Lord, we thank you for all that you have done for us in living and in dying and in rising again to return to the glory of heaven, to sit on the right-hand side of God, to intercede on our behalf. So help us this morning to trust in you as we gather to worship your name. Help us this morning to accept your grace, which is sufficient for our needs. And help us this morning to put our hand in your hand so that you will lead us and show us the way. Bless our gathering this morning with your presence of the Holy Spirit and may it surround us and protect us from harm and from the darts of the evil one, encouraging us to keep on going in this time of vacancy and uncertainty of direction in the Church of Scotland. Bless your servant Donald as he preaches the true gospel message and may he know you're upholding of him at this time as local minister with us here in the East. Grant him wisdom and knowledge as he breaks down the words in the passage we have just read for a clearer understanding of it so that it will enter our hearts and our very souls. Bless him in his work for the Lord and grant him a time of peace and relaxation with his family at this Christmas time. We pray now for all in our church who are suffering in one way or another. Comfort those who are mourning over the loss of a loved one. May they know your peace at this sad time in their lives. Grant a measure of health to the sick and the elderly in our communities. And we pray especially for the homeless and the unemployed who are experiencing difficulty at this time of year. We thank you, Lord, for street pastors and volunteers who are there to help the vulnerable in our society. We pray for our NHS staff who are working under difficult and stressful situations. But we thank you for their dedication to the job. And so look over them all and may they know you are near in their time of need. We pray this morning for our Queen and all her royal household. And we thank you for her long years reigning over us and ask you to keep her in good health as she carries out her many duties. Bless her, bless her and her family at this time, though they are not able to gather together and enjoy a time of family unity and togetherness. We pray now for our political leaders and politicians as they struggle with another wave of the new Omicron virus. Give them guidance and wisdom in their decision making and help them to work as a team to go forward in making decisions for the good of our country instead of arguing and disagreeing with one another. May they seek God in all their discussions and meetings and all that they do as another year draws to an end and the new one appears on the horizon. So bless us now as a congregation and open our minds to the gospel message and may it impact on our lives to such an extent we will want to go out and share the good news of Jesus with family, with friends, and all who we come in contact with today and in the week and the year ahead. So bless us all who are gathered here today and the families that they represent, and give us all and forgive us all our sins. And all this we ask is in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. We sing now in Mission Praise 266. I cannot tell why he whom angels worship should set his love upon the sons of men, or why, as shepherd, he should seek the wanderers to bring them back. They knew not how or when, but this I know, that he was born of Mary when Bethlehem's manger was his only home, and that he lived at Nazareth and labored and so the Saviour, Saviour of the world is come. I cannot tell why he whom angels worship should set his love upon the sons of men.
Shall we turn for a while to the passage of Scripture we read in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, and we'll just read again in verse 30. The angel said to her, Mary, that is, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Jesus is the turning point of human history, the fulcrum of world events. In fact, he marks the focal point of all creation. We read in Colossians, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. God himself needs nothing out with himself within the Godhead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is perfect love, there is perfect harmony. God is totally self-sufficient, and yet God, out of sheer grace, uh, decided to create man and woman in his own image and in his own likeness, and to share the love of the Godhead with men and women, that we might uh, be uh, privy to the amazing love that God has for the Son and the Son for the Father that we too might be the recipients of that same amazing love. God did not at the beginning create the universe, as some believe, and then just sit back and let it unwind and, and run out of energy over a period of many millions of years. He made it for a purpose. He sustains it on a continuous basis. He works to bring his eternal purposes to their ultimate fulfillment. Nothing is left to chance. God is in total control, totally sovereign over all that He has made, and His purposes will be fulfilled. When a child is born, the birth is subsequently announced. The time for the birth of Jesus was set in eternity, as was the time and purpose of His being born here on earth, and also of His death and resurrection. Jesus was not born, as some might believe, uh, as a result of a hastily conceived plan put together uh, by God when the fall uh, entered into the world. He didn't put together uh, a plan to uh, overturn the devastating consequences of sin. Jesus is plan A and always has been plan A. He's not plan B. When God made man and woman, He gave them total freedom. He gave them the freedom to eat from any tree in the garden except one. But in giving them free will, God Himself knew that they would disobey. But God is not the author of sin. Our first parents exercised their free will, and subsequently and sadly and tragically, they fell from grace as God knew that they would. But long before the fall in eternity itself, God prepared the safety net. He planned His actions in order to redeem fallen sinners such as you and me, to restore and to reconcile the relationship between God and humanity that would be broken by uh, the coming into the world of sin. We read in 1 Peter chapter 1, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. And the first announcement of the coming of Jesus into the world was made long, long before Jesus Himself came into the world. Last uh, Sunday morning when we had our nine carols and nine readings, the first reading we had was taken from Genesis chapter 3, where God gave 
what is known as the first evangelical promise, the promise that a descendant of the woman who had been deceived would one day come into the world and that he would bruise the head of the serpent who had deceived Eve, but in doing so, the serpent would strike his heel. It was the first evangelical promise. No time frame was given, but pointing down through the centuries, down through the millennia to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that uh, passage, when God was speaking directly to Satan, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And he had ascended of the woman would one day crush Satan's head, which he did at Calvary's cross outside the city walls of Jerusalem. But he did so at great pain and at great expense to himself. And God was revealing long, long before Jesus came into the world his intended action in order to rescue the a wreckage of fallen humanity. And it would be accomplished by a descendant of Eve. And just as the rising sun announces the, uh, it's just as the rising sun announces a new day, as the, the first rays of the sun come over the eastern horizon, so also with God's revelation, there was, as it were, the beginning of a new age. That first gospel promise came as a distant ray of light. God was not going to abandon humanity. He would provide a redeemer. And biblical revelation comes in stages. It comes in stages where uh, at each particular stage something more is added so that the picture is filled out. And uh, when Jesus met with the disciples on the Emmaus Road, he took them back over the Old Testament prophecies. It wasn't known as the Old Testament then. It was simply the Scriptures. But he took them back through the Scriptures and pointed out in many different places all the prophecies that pointed to his coming into the world. And that when he did come into the world, he would have to suffer. He would have to go to the cross. But on the third day, he would rise again. And how wonderful it is from our own present vantage point here 2,000 or so years on from the time of Christ that we can look back and we can see the full revelation of God's love uh, for us. God promised Abraham that through a descendant of him all nations on earth will be blessed. And Jesus, when he was arguing with the Jews on one occasion, one occasion he said, Abraham uh, rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. He didn't see it physically. He didn't see it literally. He saw it with the eye of faith. And he believed the promises that God had given to him that one of his descendants would indeed bring blessing to every nation on earth. We have not seen the Lord Jesus Christ, but we see him with the eye of faith. And yet we have been enabled by God's Spirit to love him. We love uh, writes John, because he first loved us. And 700 years B.C., when Jerusalem was under threat, the Lord told Judah's King Ahaz at that time to stand firm in his faith. He was starting to quake. He was starting to lose uh, uh, his trust that the Lord would deliver uh, Jerusalem as he had done in the past. And so the Lord sent his servant Isaiah uh, to give him a promise. He said, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And there are many people who deride that prophecy. They will say, well, if you go back into the original Hebrew, the Hebrew word that, is, that we know as virgin is not actually virgin. It's a, a young woman of childbearing age. But what sort of promise would it be for God to say to King Ahaz that the young woman of childbearing age will be with child? Most children are born of young women of childbearing age. That, there's nothing unique about that. But when the Hebrew Scriptures were translated into the Greek in the third century B.C., the translators chose the word virgin 
because they understood that that was precisely what the Lord was saying, that the child of this prophecy would be born to a virgin. But sadly, Judah's king lacked faith, and as a result, Judah was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar and the army of the Babylonians. But for God's promise for the future to prevail, the prophecy given in Isaiah chapter 9 a, those first rays of light that had appeared long, long before the time of Isaiah began to shine even brighter, revealing more clearly the source. We read there in Isaiah 9, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And then in that wonderful passage when John the Baptist was born and his father Zechariah had been unable to speak for nine months because he had doubted the word of the angel who had come to him and told him that his wife Elizabeth, even in her old age, would bear a child. And then when John the Baptist himself was born and the family were arguing about what his name would, would be, and his mother Elizabeth said his name will be John. And uh, the, the people were saying, well, there's nobody of that name in our family, and straight away, uh, uh, Zechariah's tongue was loosened, and he was able to speak for the very first time, and he said his name will be uh, John. And then, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he prophesied about his son John, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. He was almost word for word repeating what the Lord, the promise the Lord had given many, many centuries ago through the prophet Isaiah. And in a world darkened by sin, and yes, this world is darkened by sin, we inhabit a nation today which is enveloped in the darkness of unbelief, of secular humanism, of atheism, of false religions, of godless philosophies. Whichever, whichever way we turn today, there is spiritual darkness. And the birth of Jesus, the coming into the world of the one who says, I am the light of the world, reminds us that it doesn't have to be that way. There is hope. There is rescue from the miry clay of sin. There is the light of God's love, the light which is Jesus himself. And as both Isaiah and Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, state, without that light, we are living in the shadow of death. And it is a fearful and a hopeless situation that grips the whole of humanity. All living creatures ultimately face death. We have no answer to it. We have no defense. In Hebrews, we read that man is destined to die once and then face judgment. And to be judged by God if we do not have Christ is a fearful prospect. Again, in Hebrews, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Many years ago, when I was working on an oil rig in Norway, one of my uh, co-workers, an Englishman, um, he would often quote that. He, he didn't go to church. I don't know where he got it from, but he would often say uh, in hushed tones, Donald, he said, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And sadly, he died of a heart attack when he was on his leave on one occasion, and whether he had ever came to trust in the Lord, I don't know, because at that time I wasn't trusting in the Lord. But how often I heard him say, Donald, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Somehow those words had taken a hold of him and didn't seem to let him go. But uh, it needn't come to that, because in God's eternal plan to save sinners, Jesus was born of a virgin, born of a virgin to reveal his descent from that first woman, just as we all are. 
but he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit to reveal that he is, just as the angel informed Mary, the Son of God, mighty God, as we read in Isaiah chapter 9. For the Son, the Son of God, is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. Mankind fell at the very beginning of time, and a man had to atone for humanity's sins. But no man from the beginning of time was able to atone because the man who could atone for the sins of humanity had himself to be totally without uh, sin. And no such person has ever existed. And so the Son of God, in a way that we cannot comprehend, that we cannot understand, he entered in to the womb of the Virgin Mary, and he was born a sinless human being. Sinless not because of her, because she also needed a savior, just as all of us do. In Mary's song in verse 47, my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. The Roman Catholic Church believes that Mary was without sin, the immaculate conception, but that's not so. Mary needed a savior, just as you and I need a savior. And how wonderful that she was the very one that bore from her womb the Savior of the Lord. And when she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, and the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth was referring to the child in Mary's womb, and she wasn't saying that that child would grow up and become my Lord. She was saying, my Lord, even as he was. And remember the words of the Magi who came to Jerusalem to seek the one who was born the King of the Jews, not the one who would grow up to become the King of the Jews, but he was born the King of the Jews. He was the King of the Jews from his very uh, birth. And so Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. He was born in a stable because there was no room in the inn. And eventually he went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, shedding his blood for our transgressions. Joseph, son of David, said the Hebrew, said the angel Gabriel, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is the Greek for Joshua, the Hebrew, which simply means the one who saves, the one who saves. And at this time of year, there uh, is so much fuss made over the child lying in the manger. And there are many people who would love to freeze that child and leave him lying there in a manger because a helpless baby threatens nobody except King Herod at that particular time. But this baby had a task to accomplish, not as a baby, not as a child, not as a teenager, but as a grown man of about 30 years of age. And that task involved going to the cross to suffer and die for the sins of God's people, but to rise from the grave on the third day for the justification of the Lord's people. Christmas is about the coming into the world of the Son of God, to be born as the child Jesus. And without Jesus, it's a meaningless orgy of pagan consumerism. When I was having lunch with my grandchildren uh, yesterday, my uh, granddaughter, uh, Rowan Margaret, she's five years of age, and she wanted us to sing, Happy Birthday, Dear Jesus. It was really uh, touching. So we all sang around the table, Happy Birthday, Dear Jesus. Happy Birthday to you. People often say Christmas is for children. Well, I would say no, it's not for children. It's for all people, people young,
people old, because without the incarnation of God the Son, without the death of Jesus, without his resurrection, there would be no hope for any of us, either for this life or for the life to come. And Jesus is God's free gift, freely offered to the whoever's of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The free offer of God's Son, the gift freely given to the whoever's of the world who will reach out by faith and to lay hold of Jesus. And may God grant us a desire to do just that, to reach out by faith and to take this wonderful and inestimable gift freely offered, freely given. Jesus, Jesus of whom Paul wrote, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Can all of us here say that this morning? The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I pray and trust that we would all be able to say that from our hearts. Amen, and may the Lord add his blessing to these thoughts and meditations upon his word. Our heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, your willingness to send your son into the world, Emmanuel, to, to come not just to uh, leave, leave us with memorable parables or to cast out demons or to heal the sick, but to ultimately go to the cross and there pay the penalty for our sins. We thank you, Lord, for the willingness of Jesus to come. He did not come against his will. He came in conformity with the covenant that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had entered into in eternity to come into the world at a point of time. And come he did, that first advent. And we await the second advert, advent when Jesus will come again. Grant, grant that we would be ready and waiting with our lamps trimmed and filled with oil when that great day comes. Take away anything said this morning that's not in conformity with your word. May the glory be yours and the blessings ours in Christ Jesus. Amen. We conclude our service by singing in a paraphrase 19. The race that long in darkness pined have seen a glorious light. The people dwell in day who dwelt in death's surrounding night. To hail thy rise, thou better sun, the gathering nations come, joyous as when the reapers bear the harvest treasures home.
And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit, one God, rest and remain with you all now and forever. Amen.